so uh, let's let's take this back to the beginning then mike um what's your bullshit backstory tell us like, where it all started tell us about your career and and for those that, that yeah, may, so, may not already know so i was born in uh, the jungle didn't know my parents <laughs> <laughs> i had to claw my way no um <laughs> nothing unusual really just my dad's in the army so i am the son of a soldier and i was uh Born in Germany, lived in Germany for a couple of years, kept moving every two years back into like normal squatty brats. And then when I was like six, we moved back over to Germany from the UK and I didn't like going to school in Germany. So I started asking my mum and dad if I could go to school in England. I hammered them for a year and eventually they relented and they, the army sort of pay, pay your fees if you want to be go to like private school. I don't know if you know this, a lot of people no. don't know. So they pay like a big contribution. So um, I went to a boarding school in North Wales. So I was the oldest of three children and the only one that went to boarding school. So from age seven, I went to boarding school and was then the only army child at that school. So we didn't have the money to be there. So I was like sort of um, exposed to a completely different type of person that actually paid for education and yeah. their parents all owned businesses and stuff like that. So I was surrounded by that at a young age and it didn't seem unusual because obviously your, your childhood's your childhood, isn't it? But I think that was probably the biggest influence on what I went on to do later on, because most of my friends that were in the army either joined the army or did similar types of jobs, you know, joined the police force, yeah. joined the fire brigade. But I always kind of felt like I was going to have a business from really a young age. And I think it was that was the reason why, because I was looking thinking, oh, well, his dad is a builder and they've got multiple properties or, you know, his dad has got a helicopter when I've been to his house or whatever. And it blew my mind that people actually live this life. So my nan always says that even age eight, nine, ten, I was said I was going to be like a millionaire. And I kind of, I never thought of it as like a conscious decision, like I'm going to become that. I, I just believed I would at some point. That's fascinating. It's, it's, it's that, um, it almost normalizes it, doesn't it? You know, when they say about your, um, your, your circle of, of associates, like yeah. if, you, if you were all in a circle. Or the average like, of your five friends. Yeah, that. if it becomes normal that your friends are, YouTubers or our millionaires or our business people, you're going to pick up and learn from that. And that's with anything. And, and, and if, if you hang, around, it, yeah, you hang yeah. around with drug dealers, that will be well, not drug dealers, but like people that just like sniffing, <laughs> sniffing, sniffing, sniffing beak or whatever on a yeah, Friday, yeah. Saturday night, you've got to be pretty strong willed not to do that. Yeah. So it's a lot easier to do that. So I do think there is something in that. But yeah, so that was it. So age seven went to boarding school and my mum and dad then would give me like a, an allowance. 200 pound a month it was it sounds a lot but they didn't buy me anything it was almost like i had to buy my own toiletries my own sweets all that type of stuff like if i was at this age seven shit M mad isn't it so i don't even buy my own toilet paper now that's yeah, like so a like, mrs beard thing can you imagine how much that costs as well for uh -huh. him? do you remember i know it's a weird thing you remember jolly ranchers i don't even remember them yeah they the were sweets. like hard sweets how yeah. nice were they by the way oh yeah they were, they were like an you a, could probably american, eat two ton of them <laughs> i don't know man they were like you said they, they were hard but they were like an american export one that came yeah, yeah. to england kind of a certain time. I'm old enough to remember, yeah, Mike. But so like, so Jolly Manager or something, I remember the school, so they were, they were having ever much to wear a packet, like 30p a pack. But because I was budgeting for myself, I knew if I bought like a pack of seven, it would work out like 22p a pack. So I started to like realise that about money. Oh, economies of scale and buying things in bulk and yeah, yeah. stuff like that. And this isn't the, I used to sell chocolate in the playground and that's why I'm an entrepreneur, not that kind of bullshit thing. But it's just, I realised if you bought, bought stuff in bulk, you could either then sell the excess and you've, you could keep the extra money. And so I started doing that from really young uh, in boarding school. And then it went on to selling cigarettes because my mum and dad lived in Germany, so I'd get tax-free fags. Yeah. I used to be bringing over a box of 800. You used to buy, they look like a giant cigarette box with like loads of packets inside. Break them up, I was selling for like 20, 30 p a cigarette and stuff. Boarding school, even in the primary school, you'd work, you'd, your school would start at half eight and it'd finish at five. So you're doing longer days, but it meant you got like 10 weeks off in the summer. Um, all right. stuff like that so you do um and then it was like um supervised homework so i did all right in school in terms of grades i won't reel them off i've never been asked to give them in a job interview but they're all later see you know when you do your gcse's and then i left there and went to like a state school sick form so i'd gone from being in a class of like 15 to 20 in my whole year at that school shit at sports as you can imagine and not even got enough like a rugby team properly can you stand up right you're in the team <laughs> so we used to get battered whenever we played sports or whatever but then I, I went to a, an actual sick form of a high school in Hollywell, North Wales. And it was the first time I'd ever been to a school with like a thousand kids. And it was like, you know, they'd have like four or five different uh, forms in each year yeah. and stuff. So it was like a complete culture shock to me. 
And uh, I just sort of got my head down, got my A-levels. And then all this time, like my mum and dad like, were living in Germany and stuff like that. So I would never really go home, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and then I went to university, age 18. I was in, I did criminology and criminal justice in University of East London, proper um, rough area of London as well. And that was it. I then had a criminology degree. I applied for a job. I was going to, what I really thought I was going to do is be sort of like a criminologist or something. But in the meantime, I was waiting for that. I applied for a job at a Young Offenders Institute. Bearing in mind at this time, I must have been like nine and a half stone wet through. It's like 21, 22. Applied for a job there and the salary was 13 grand a year. And they give me, I went for the interview and they told me what it was. So it was um, 77 hour, hours a week, seven days. So you do seven days on, then you get seven days off. So essentially you're working two weeks. In one uh, week. Uh, you, yeah, you're working two weeks working in one week, but then you've got seven days to recover. And it made I was thinking, all right, sound that's I'm only working six months a year. You know, because you're like, young, you don't go, like, <laughs> oh no, I'm not. I'm just like doing a year's worth of work in half the time. So, so what would you need me to do? And it's, uh, if anyone knows um, Thorn Cross Young Offenders Institute, it's kind of like a sort of semi-open prison. And they wanted me to be on a unit. Bear in mind, I'm 21. <laughs> um, 60 inmates at any one time. And I had to supervise them from 11 p.m. at night till 11 a.m. in the morning on my own. <laughs> and I was like, what? And they go, yeah, it's like 15 to, I think it's 15 to 21 is the age at, at this place. And they're all like... Can you imagine the size of some 15-year-olds? Yeah, but even like the 20-year-olds. And I'm like, so I'm, I've am i got to... T- bear in mind, like, you've got a degree, whatever. And you paid £13,000 a year for this? That's exactly what I said. So <laughs> I, I walked out of there. My mum and dad have gone like, oh, so how did the interview go? I said, I am not supervising 60, 15 to 21-year-old, like... Offenders. Offenders. Yeah, yeah. On my own. And it's also... Going they can let, them, let themselves in and out of the rooms <laughs> excuse me do you mind just going to bed please no mate okay <laughs> so i thought like fuck that so then i got a job in sales and that was the beginning for me then i couldn't believe that in sales you got paid a salary so you got paid a salary for turning up to work then if you sold anything you got paid more it's like you pay me to sell stuff well you're now going to pay me to stuff for actually yeah, doing yeah. the job as well and then I, I was earning like double what i would have earned at young offense institute and not likely to get beat up or stabbed. So I just thought, this is the life for me. I can't believe that you are now in a job where, and while I didn't have my own business, yeah. I thought of it as being self-employed. The company I worked for just provided me the things that I sold. Yeah. So you'd get out what you put in type of thing. And I just took to sales so well, and that was it. And I was so off. What were you selling then at the time? Um, so my first sales job was a, a car phone warehouse. That was my... Fucking hell, man. They've, they've produced some prodigies. So Jimmy yeah. Hill, who we were just telling you about... Um, Rest- R.I.P. <laughs> <Don't know. laughs> oh, different one. Yeah, he he was the same. He uh, he started at Carphone Warehouse and he was buying back people's phones. Yeah. You know, as they're coming for trading, it's like, oh, I'll give you 100 quid for them and then selling them on eBay. Oh, see, was he doing a little side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so I ended up getting sacked from there for having a little side scam of my own. This must be the thing. You weren't quite as smart as Mr. Jimmy Hill then, were you? He didn't get caught. Millionaires, <laughs> this has been made by yeah. <laughs> Carphone Warehouse. Man, so like I got a... sacked by Carphone Warehouse, yeah. But I'd had for other jobs. I'd worked in Bookies and I'd worked at McDonald's. Everyone needs to do a stint there to learn about life, don't they? But um, yeah, so I failed my floor manager exam at McDonald's. Like, uh, yeah, well, I wasn't good enough to pass the at exam. To be, yeah, yeah, I passed. I failed that exam. <laughs> they were fuming at me. I said, like, I just feel like my dissertation that I'm also doing at the same time is slightly more important. <laughs> <laughs> they saw their ass over it. And um, it's funny, like the guy that was there, it's one of them like, I've seen a hundred lads like you before. You think you're going to go on and do something and blah, blah, blah. And he's still in McDonald's now in Warrington 16 years later. But yeah, um, so yeah, I just started doing sales and started making like decent money. But I, I saw it as it's my own business. So when I first was, a, I could sit next to anybody on the floor, you know, when you're learning and doing yeah. your training. And I had a, a good mate that worked there at the time. And he goes, oh, come sit next to me. I sat next to him for one day. He goes, this is easy. This, you don't even have to do many sales and you weren't, you end up getting three pound a deal. So it's like, how much commission are you making? He was like, oh, I'll make 300 quid a month. And I was like, right, okay then. I was thinking that who's the one that's making the most money in here let me sit next to that guy so i just said who's making the most money i went and sat next to him a couple of scousers i won't say their name they'll know who it is if they <laughs> hear this and they were making like two grand a month commission this is massive money you know when you're like 21 and stuff within about six weeks i went from being brand new on the shop floor to being like the fifth fourth or fifth top earner in a big call center of like maybe 60 of us and they had one in preston as well anyway we all get called in probably about six, seven weeks into me starting there. 
And it turns out the biggest earners there will show me some tricks that you weren't meant to do or you weren't meant to do. So I'd not been doing it right. And then I got booted out. Oh, never. For, um, so I was then put in retention. So you know when you want to quit, I was the guy that was like, you don't want to do that. You want to sign up for a Motorola Razor for £50 <laughs> pound a month or whatever. So I was that guy. I was like, I won't let you leave this business yeah. guy. And it turns out that all the tricks of the trade that I've been taught by these scousers <laughs> um, didn't quite work out. So I got sacked and so did six, so did six of them. So that was it. I was like, what the hell am I going to do? Got a job at BT. Then went to Ibiza and just messed about in Ibiza for a year and then come back and thought, I'm 24 now, I need to do something. And then I thought, do you know what I want to do? I've always wanted my own business. I don't want to pay someone to teach me in a step-by-step course. I don't want to do any of these things. I like to learn through experience and doing. I think that's the best sort of teacher and the best way to learn. So I thought, why spend two grand on somebody's course to learn how to do business? Why don't I just go and work in somebody's startup business and actually get paid to learn? Yeah. And that's what I did. I, I then went and worked in a startup for two and a half years. And I would say I was like maybe the 15th person in that startup. So it wasn't brand new. And then I thought, now I need to do extra learning. I left there and took a pay cut so I went down to 14 grand a year, which is mad, isn't it? After, you know, doing the job that I did to go and work in a business that had no employees. I was the very first employee. They didn't have a sales process. They didn't have a way to um, acquire new businesses. They had a single page website, but I knew I would learn more about business there than you would at any blue chip company or yeah. corporate company or whatever. And I just worked there and I basically, you're sat in a room sort of like half the size of this with three founders of a business and you're hearing conversations that you're well above your pay grade. You're not meant to hear about marketing strategy and budgets and stuff. You know, if you're just like a telly sales guy, yeah, yeah. but I was, so I was just absorbing everything and I stayed there for four years. And that, that were a conscious decision. To, conscious decision. That was. Is, that's just crazy to think about because most people, I mean, especially you just mentioned it before, like TikTok and instant gratification. And this goes back to like other conversations we've had, but to have the foresight to go, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to spend the next seven or eight years just learning to then put myself in a position to. Well, I thought I want to run my own business, but why would I risk it and do it out on my own time and like pocket to start with? So I did that as a conscious decision to say, I'm going to learn everything I can about startup business while I'm getting paid to be here. People always say like, what's your one piece of advice for anyone that's starting their own business? I said, if you you think you want to run your own business, go and do two years in a startup business yeah. because ideally in the sector you want to work in, but even if it's not, you're still going to learn. But then I hear, well, I'm not going to like take a pay cut up to do it, but you have to, because if you want to run your own business anyway, you're probably going to have to take a pay yeah, cut. You're going to a but also I hear this is like a reason not to, well, what if the startup fails or what if the business, you know, goes under or I get made redundant. Good. Because now you're seeing the absolute worst that could happen if you run your own business. So that's better learning yeah. than anything else. You'll always find another job. You can always go back to what you used to do, but you're not going to hear about sales processes, marketing, uh, the accounting software, launching a CRM, data, marketing, sales, all these different things that when you're sat in a room and you're hearing every conversation, you learn so much and you're in a position where you can actually impact that business on a daily basis. I used to come up with ideas. We'd be trying it two days, three days later. Yeah. But if you work for BT, if you go, oh, I've got an idea how we can make the you know, the dialer more efficient, that's got to go through about 15 layers of management. And then it might take a year to roll out. So I was in a position where I could suggest you, things, you could try, try things. Stuff, not on your own dime or yeah. at your own risk. But also my idea was, if I'm the first person in a business and I stay here, I like it, I earn a lot of money and I don't set up my own business, you're always by virtue of being there longer than most people, well, everybody else you're kind of senior to everybody. So you'll always be getting promoted as more people come in because the next sales guy comes in. I train that sales guy. I'm now a team leader by yeah, default. Yeah. I'm now the sales team. I've, I've never been a sales team leader before, <laughs> but I am now. And that's how it started. So I just did that for four years. And at the end of that, I was on 75 grand. So I've gone from 14 to 75 grand a year in four years. Whoa. Um, and that's when I knew... I've learned enough here that I think now I was kind of restricted. I couldn't really make much more money because people were starting to get arsy about how much money I was earning at this point. Um, I could do this for myself. So I made the conscious decision then. I looked at my expenses and I've always been a saver by nature. I'm not very like frivolous or whatever. I don't wear any like jewelry. Um, I drive a Tiguan. 
like and all this you know like nothing's yeah. like flash or anything so I, my actual expenses were two grand a month so i made a conscious decision a year before i left to set up my own business i know i can survive for six months on 12 grand and it not really affect my daily living so the day i had 12 grand in my bank account was the day i was going to leave so i saved the grand every month and then once it hit 12 grand i walked into work and i quit that day and i had a baby on the way at that time so i come home at 10 30 10 30 in the morning on a, but honestly we'd never have more money than 75 grand it was like it was like four and a half grand after tax yeah. in your account and she was like, wait, like, what, what, why do you want to throw this all in? I just said, I don't want somebody else to be in charge of my actual earning capabilities. I want the ability to be able to earn as much or as little as I want to and yeah. work when I want. I have the freedom, the opportunity to like choose when I want to do things. And I was 29 at the time. If I don't do it now, when will I do it? You're never ready. Yeah, yeah. But I felt with uh, six years in startup business, I felt I had just enough learning and understood business enough to have a crack at doing it on my own. I didn't think I was definitely going to be successful. I just thought I've got a fair crack of the whip here. And it was because I knew I had 12 grand in my account that whatever I did, I had six months to come up with an idea that worked before I had to go back and get a job. And that's what I did. I didn't even know what my startup was going to be on the day I quit. That's, that's wild, man.